Welcome back to Canna Week, brought to you by New Frontier Data, where we deliver the week's top headlines in cannabis and hear experts weigh in on the impact these stories are having on the industry. I'm your host, Heather Wickline. Our first guest was appointed CEO of the Canadian Securities Exchange in July 2011. An early advocate for the cannabis industry, the CSC is now the global exchange leader in the listings of issuers in the space. Recognized by Financial Post Magazine as one of Canada's 25 cannabis industry power players and a recent a recipient of the American Trade Association's Captain of the Industry Award in November 2018, please welcome Richard Carlton. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Heather. My pleasure. Great. And our next guest is a Can a Week regular. He's a pioneering thought leader in the cannabis industry. He has developed market leading forecasts for the growth of the industry, uncovered groundbreaking insights into the cannabis consumer, and led the first of its kind anal analysis of global cannabis demand. Please welcome our Chief Knowledge Officer here at New Frontier Data, John Kikia. Good to be back, Heather. Thank you. Always great to have you. Well, we have lots to cover, so we're going to dive right in. Uh, last week, Yahoo Finance published an article titled, This VC Firm Has Predicted Big Cannabis Would Shrink, What Happens Next? So as uh, Canada legalized adult use in 2018, a lot of countries have looked at them as kind of a blueprint for how to operate on a national scale. Um, when the industry first came online, capital was flowing freely and uh, investors were excited at the prospect of getting on the ground level of a new consumer market in North America. Um, but since then, as we know, the Canadian cannabis market, like many others throughout the globe, has undergone a serious, significant market corrections and now dealing with this international pandemic. Uh, all these factors have brought about reductions in M&A, mergers and acquisitions activity, stock valuations and operational footprints. And companies have been compelled to streamline operations and adjust their growth strategies. So I guess what we want to hear is what are the biggest ch changes that we've been seeing in the Canadian cannabis capital market since the onset of adult use legalization? And I'll start well, with you, Rich. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, Heather. Um, well, obviously, uh, as uh, the Yahoo article pointed out, uh, there has been uh, both a uh, constrainment of uh, capital being made available to the uh, industry and there's been a change in the character of the capital as well um, and understand uh, we at the Canadian Securities Exchange uh, have a lot of insight into the trends because not only of course did we take a leading role in the capitalization of the industry in Canada uh, but all of the US uh, public multi-state operators are also listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange uh, which has given us uh, extremely good visibility into uh, trends in the United States as well. Um, you know, the Canadian story is really a, a case where, um, in many respects, um, the companies, the early companies, uh, the, the Tweeds, the Afrias, the Auroras, uh, and so on, uh, were very much treated like uh, private equity back type companies. Uh, they were given a lot of cash and company management was uh, encouraged by their investors, by their boards, by their advisors to really grow at all costs, you know, to make sure that every, uh, you know, piece of the game was covered, uh, whether it was uh, cultivation, extraction, product development, um, you know, moves from dried flower products into edibles, beverages. And then obviously international expansion, looking at lower cost cultivation jurisdictions, whether it was in South America or South Af uh, Southern Africa or uh, Asia even, um, as well as obviously acquiring licenses in different uh, jurisdictions in Europe as uh, they appear to liberalize uh, at least their medical uh, regimes. So, the, and, and management's feet really weren't being held to the fire on profitability or uh, EBITDA positivity or so on. You know, the thing that uh, investors were rewarding at that stage was just that growth, you know, at all costs, make the investments all over the place. You know, we don't know how this is gonna work out, but we wanna make sure that we've got basically some chips down on every one of these opportunities as they present themselves. And, you know, that obviously changed very quickly. Um, the valuations, uh, because it's a public market. It's not a private equity market where capital uh, is intended to be, or by definition is going to be more patient uh, with a five to seven to 10 year horizon uh, for an investment return. 
here you've got investors, uh, analysts, advisors that are obviously held to a quarterly benchmark in many cases. And uh, you began to, to see uh, you know, the sentiment of the investor community change uh, as these companies uh, burned more and more cash, uh, seizing these opportunities. And instead of narrowing that line of uh, cash consumed versus uh, revenues generated, um, you know, they were in fact getting farther and farther away from it and began to suffer the consequences uh, from that. So again, we saw less capital beginning to uh, flow into those uh, companies. They had a harder time raising money uh, to, to pursue additional opportunities. And uh, you know, it has to be said that virtually every one of the senior management teams uh, of those uh, companies is now gone. Uh, they've been replaced yep. by folks uh, who have a clearer mandate uh, to trim costs, to optimize operations, to exit uh, opportunities that uh, show no immediate uh, prospects of return uh, in an effort to try to uh, bring these uh, companies to, to profitability. So, so that's on the operating side. On the other side of the coin, uh, I may have made a face uh, for the viewers when you talked about international jurisdictions looking at Canada as a blueprint. Um, it may be a blueprint, but there's a blueprint of a lot of things that also that weren't done very well. Uh, that also hurt the companies because the Canadian LPs had an expectation that there was going to be an opportunity to compete with the illicit market. And as we all know, uh, one of the unique aspects, uh, at least dating back to alcohol prohibition in the 20s and 30s in North America, is that we know there's a huge consumer market for this uh, for the products. It's there. Uh, it's just a case of the legal market uh, displacing the illicit market in a variety of jurisdictions around North America. So in order to be able to do that though, the legal market needs to provide good quality products at a reasonable price uh, in a retail environment that uh, uh, consumers are comfortable with, uh, is able to engage through marketing, education, sales activities. And that's simply, those conditions weren't in place in Canada in most jurisdictions. Uh, in fact, the local governments were deeply conflicted uh, on their support because in Canada, this wasn't a popular measure that was approved by um, uh, plebiscite or referendum type uh, propositions on, on the ballots in various states in 2016, 2018, and so on. Um, this was a, basically the federal government thinking this up and doing it and then downloading um, the hard questions like zoning, licensing, regulations around advertising, and so on to the provincial and local governments. And many of these provincial and local governments weren't in fact uh, philosophically on side uh, with the move. Now, I, I think they were wrong uh, for the record, but it was a fact that uh, uh, retail, particularly in the most populous province in Canada, Ontario, where I happen to live, um, was deeply, deeply flawed. And so, for example, for the first year, uh, only 25 retail licenses, so that 25 locations uh, for a province with a population of, uh, I don't know, 14, 15 million people, uh, were available. It was grossly underserved. So on the one hand, you've got uh, companies that are increasingly being um, held to um, uh, sales and revenue measures uh, that a normal public company would. On the other hand, their ability to compete with uh, the illicit market and to be able to grow that sales uh, volume uh, domestically was being hampered by the slow pace of the regulations and in some cases some very poor regulations that are implemented by the local governments. So they really got caught in a in a squeeze from from really both sides. Yeah, I mean, well, you guys were the first, so it's kind of understandable that you're gonna make mistakes when you're the first people to kind of take over this this market. Um, but what what one quote that was in that article um, was from the CEO of Canopy Rivers, he said, his prediction that vertical integration doesn't work. He's like, you can't be everything to everyone when, and, and right, when you had cash flowing in and it was great, it was easy to keep, keep up that and keep up that and try to, you know, expand your footprint and, and get bigger and bigger. But he's saying when stuff gets, starts to get a little tight with money, you can't be everything to everyone. You can't do everything well. Would you I, agree I, with that? 
I, I put it uh, slightly differently, and I've been saying this for some period of time. Name me one industry where the farmers make the money. <laughs> there isn't one. Um, even as necessary as they are for the, uh, uh, you know, for, for, the, for the completed product. But, uh, you know, I can grow the best hops in the world, uh, but I'm pretty sure that uh, Anheuser-Busch uh, is going to make uh, the uh, high margins uh, and that I'm going to get squeezed as the primary producer of one of the uh, constituent uh, products on an annual basis from the, uh, you know, from that market. So, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, these companies were having to spend millions and billions acquiring cultivation uh, capacity, uh, which is a very, very capital intensive, low, like, in all likelihood, a low margin business, uh, especially up here in the Northern Hemisphere where it's gotta be done indoors with uh, lots of energy um, applied uh, during the, the winter months and everything, uh, was gonna make that a very, very difficult uh, uh, business plan to execute on. And I think we've seen the companies um, look to shed those sorts of assets uh, and acquire um, finished product from from third parties, and then what they're good at is, you know, again, as a consumer packaged goods company, thinking about product positioning, price levels, quality, and to the extent that they can advertise, market, and engage in consumer education and so on, uh, do those activities as well. Right, John. What's your opinion on this? So uh, I, I, just to echo Richard's point about the farmers not making the money, um, I'm in Kenya, I'm doing this interview from Kenya, and I have an uncle who runs a coffee farm. And I remember his first time going to a Starbucks and being aghast that what he was being paid for a pound of his raw beans is what they were charging for a cup in Starbucks. Um, which just shows that, you know, it start, the, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the farmer was not the one who's making the money on this prime Ken Kenyan coffee. Um, it, it was Starbucks. And I think with cannabis, we're absolutely seeing that same level of, of commoditization, um, and particularly going and growing in the Northern Hemisphere, where, where the cost of production indoor in winter, even if you've got the most energy efficient facility in the world, um, it is going to be a very resource intensive thing to do. Um, but also uh, echoing Richard's point about some of the challenges that the Canadian operators in particular faced at the outset of this market. Um, you know, one of the, the aspects that I think led to that initial frothing in this market between say um, 2014, uh, really spiking in 2016 through that, that period through 2018 was uh, very unrealistic expectations about how long it takes a market to get from the point of legalization to the point where it's running a viable, sustainable, efficient, revenue generating uh, market. And so um, we saw this in Canada where, you know, in, in some respects, it was relatively easy to get legalization through. The advocates might, might say that was a really challenging thing, but broadly speaking, um, it was, it was um, a fairly kind of efficient process for them to get the law passed, but actually implementing that law into a viable, sustainable market was a phenomenally challenging uh, thing to do. And they still haven't ironed out all of the kinks. Um, and that's been broadly true, uh, even in the North America, in, in the US markets at the state level, but because the US state markets tend to be smaller, uh, a little more agile, a little more flexibly managed than, than you see when you start trying to uh, deploy a, a national scale market. Um, I, I don't think stakeholders outside the US understood that trying to do this at the national level is going to be a far messier affair than, than you would see if you're trying to take um, Colorado as a, as, a, as a comparator market for, for um, how this happens. And then you, you, you look outside of North America, and we also think there were very unrealistic expectations about how quickly the global dominoes were going to fall, whether that was in how quickly things like the German or Australian markets were going to have patients participating in those programs and those patients consuming significant volumes of product, um, or whether it was going to be how quickly you'd be able to, to establish viable cultivation facilities in Latin America, in Asia, and, uh, uh, and in Southern Africa. Um, and so, you know, part of the recalibration that we're seeing now, I think, is a very appropriate uh, transition away from what I believe has been too much irrational exuberance with a much more clear-eyed, much more sober assessment uh, uh, about how this cannabis opportunity is going to evolve. And I think what investors are saying now is like, all right, we get it. There's, there's clearly opportunity in this market. 
um, from our assessment, we're talking about a global cannabis consumer economy today that is valued at approximately $350 billion. The demand is absolutely there and consumers are spending money on this, but it is going to take a while to establish a market that can effectively transition these consumers uh, from the unregulated market to the legal one. And for investors, you have to understand that, that um, you know, while the opportunity exists, this is not going to be an overnight turnkey, turnkey sensational uh, growth market, uh, but one which uh, the, the operators who have the most strategic implementation, the most focused uh, approach, and who have a really acute understanding of what their both near-term and long-term uh, path to profitability are going to be, um, are going to be best suited to both be um, profitable today, but also capture this market opportunity as it uh, evolves into the future. Yeah, John, I absolutely agree with that uh, assessment. And in fact, I think in many respects, um, some of the US jurisdictions are now farther ahead of the Canadian uh, jurisdictions, where we see, again, some of our companies uh, like uh, Cresco and Curaleaf and Trueleaf and Green Thumb Industries and so on, uh, which have shown just tremendous revenue growth uh, mm -hmm. in their home markets of uh, Illinois and, and Florida uh, and California and so on. And uh, yeah, they do have seem to be, and uh, you know, my view uh, for what it's worth is that uh, the ability for them to create a very compelling consumer experience uh, to engage in sales and marketing activities like any consumer packaged goods company uh, would uh, by and large, Mm -hmm. um, has has really helped them uh, get over the hump and uh, be you know drive towards uh, significant sales growth and uh, through uh, in fact in some cases uh, full on profitability at this point. Um, now you know this isn't the end state by any stretch of the imagination because of course we still have all of the issues confronting operators in the United States related to banking and supply chains that are limited to single jurisdictions. Uh, uh, the 280E uh, tax issues uh, for corporations. Uh, you still have some jurisdictions that limit the uh, ability of public companies to access licensing. And again, as you point out, uh, the licensing uh, regime in a number of jurisdictions in the US is, uh, I guess I'll be polite and say chaotic. Um, but, Are you saying uh, it's complicated here in the US? Is that what you're getting at? <laughs> well, you know, in some areas, yes. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, the, the, we, we have seen, I think, that the dawn of, you know, what it takes to be successful uh, in the space. Uh, but, you know, again, you know, in terms of the nine inning ball game, uh, we're probably still, uh, you know, in, somewhere in the first inning, I think, at this point, in terms of, uh, you know, who ultimately captures a, a meaningful market share and, uh, and profitability. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Well, since John, you touched a little bit on um, international um, expansion, um, mm -hmm. our next uh, article, Investor Business Daily reported earlier this week that marijuana stocks fall amid industry's latest international pullback. So mm -hmm. as we talked about, a lot of the larger Canadian LPs have really been focused on expansion, which also include international markets. And as John mentioned just recently, that uh, you know, the realities of the, the speed of which these markets are ready to expand, um, they just weren't there. Um, <clears throat> and across the industry, longer term plans have really been shelved in order to prioritize this path towards near term sustainable profitability. So, Richard, how have you seen LPs, you know, balance this near term strategic growth with long term expansion planning? Yeah, I guess the mistake that the uh, Canadian LPs made, um, and again, I don't think it was necessarily a mistake because they were being cheered on uh, by the investment oh, community at yeah. the time. Uh, those investments uh, or acquisitions uh, were, were being done. But, you know, again, we have to appreciate that in most jurisdictions of the world, um, and, and, and it may actually be like UK, Canada, the United States, New Zealand, and Australia, uh, that are the jurisdictions that legalize for recreational use, the rest of the world's medical, yep. which is a completely different uh, mindset path to market, uh, supply chains, uh, engagement, uh, because, you know, obviously in the medical markets, you have to be, um, you know, top of mind with the physicians and the uh, uh, pharmacy folks uh, in order to ensure that your product is being prescribed 
or made available to address uh, you know, a number of different uh, health conditions. Uh, different market altogether than uh, a consumer packaged goods uh, market that effectively you're looking at, as I say, today in Canada, the United States, and, and I expect in the, the other parts of uh, uh, what is referred to as, I guess, the old Commonwealth, uh, John. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, um, and, and, and so I think that was, that was part of the, the thought process was that, uh, yeah, uh, you know, Germans and French and Italians and Danish people, whatever, they smoke lots of weed. Let's, uh, you know, dive in there and, uh, you know, there's a potential big uh, sales opportunity. But again, addressing that opportunity was going to take a completely different skill set and uh, path to market and probably even a longer time to build uh, material sales volume uh, than you would in an adult use uh, market. Right. Well, John, I know your team has done a lot of um, work and look at the global markets. W what are your thoughts on this? So uh, I completely echo everything Richard has just said, and, and maybe just two, two points to add to that. One is this idea of um, when you go medical, particularly the way some of the, the European markets are, are treating cannabis as a medical compound, not only do you face a much higher burden um, uh, in terms of getting the healthcare community to, to buy into medical cannabis. You know, we're still in an ecosystem where broadly speaking, medical ca cannabis as a medical medicinal therapy is not being taught in most medical schools. So there's a lot of ground level education that has to be done. And there isn't this kind of laissez-faire approach to medical cannabis that you've seen in the US where broadly speaking, physicians who think that uh, you could benefit from it will, will be willing to, to write you a recommendation. Just the protocols of healthcare practice uh, in Europe in particular, I think at a much higher, at a, at a different type of threshold that will make um, the deep ingress of medical cannabis as a widely prescribed uh, 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 therapeutic uh, much, much more difficult to do. And then second is um, it being treated like a true medicinal therapy, uh, almost close to the standard of a pharmaceutical, means that the scientific standards which you have to, to produce, to the, the, the um, uh, not just the product quality, uh, but the science that has to affirm uh, the, the kind of uh, rec recommendation or prescription of cannabis uh, has to be at a much higher standard than we've seen historically in North America. And candidly, I think a lot of these LPs have just underestimated how uh, challenging it would be to overcome those hurdles. And then third is the consumer orientation. So um, uh, to Richard's point, a lot of Europeans consume a lot of cannabis. There's no question about that. Uh, but it's a very different proposition when you're now saying that, you know, you, your only line of access is going to have to be you having a hard conversation with your physician, convincing him to persuade uh, to, that, that, that you need it, convincing him that it is safe for him to, to write you this recommendation, uh, and having to go through this as a truly clinical kind of white glove process which candidly, you know, for the recreational consumer, those are a lot of hoops uh, to go through. That's a lot of kind of personal exposure that I don't think many were willing to do. And it's going to take a while until you have that psychic shift happen across European society where you have the sort of level of embrace of medicinal cannabis that you've seen uh, in, in North America. And, and John, to the point there, all of that has added considerable cost uh, at the, uh, in effect, at the consumer level in Europe so that Again, as far as competing with the uh, the illicit market or the existing market or whatever the polite way of referring to it is, uh, it, it, they, it is extremely difficult to uh, compete when you're three times the cost. Uh, or, you know, it, it's that order of magnitude, I think, um, between the legal and the illicit market. But, but it is fascinating, um, you know, in talking with colleagues uh, from France and Germany and some of the other large European jurisdictions, um, I mean, I always felt that one of the more compelling uh, arguments, uh, particularly for those of us in, in Canada and the northern U.S. states that didn't have a, um, uh, a legacy uh, grow operation uh, culture, uh, and I'm, I guess, referring to our friends in Northern California and Oregon, Washington, and parts of Colorado, um, but, um, uh, you, you know, you've obviously had a significant source of revenue for organized crime. And uh, it was, uh, that was an enormous uh, uh, part of the overall illicit market. And uh, that is doubly true in Europe. But I haven't heard that conversation, uh, you know, going on at the, at the political level 
as a justification as to why there should be further liberalization uh, or a change in tact from a medical market to an adult use market. Um, because when you consider who the bad guys are in Europe uh, that are in control of the trade, um, uh, you know, again, they're way worse than the ones we have in North America, and I'll leave it at that. So interesting point there, and maybe part of the reason for that, Richard, I think is the the illicit market component that I think was led to, to some of the strong support for legalization that you saw stateside was more on the effect that it was having on the consumers who were being prosecuted rather than uh, in an effort to, to, to capture the revenues that was being earned by the uh, unregulated market. Yes, taxation revenue was part of the argument, uh, but I think kind of the human cost, the societal cost of prohibition enforcement um, was, was a catalyst for uh, seeing that transition in places like Colorado, uh, Oregon, and, and, and California. Um, and for some reason that, that because, I mean, maybe because the Europeans have not been as punitive in their enforcement of, uh, against consumers, um, you know, they've been willing to turn a blind eye uh, to, to their uh, uh, much more uh, aggressive <laughs> uh, organized entities that are running the unregulated markets <laughs> there. But because, you know, that's not downstreaming into, into you know, uh, uh, Uncle Sam and Auntie Jane being arrested for, for cannabis, um, there's been less kind of public focus on the idea uh, of needing to, to dismantle prohibition in its current form. Yeah, I think that's a really good explanation, John. I, I, I think you're right, uh, because uh, uh, there's no doubt that that is, a, I think, was a, was a significant factor. And, uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, little factoids that always, it didn't, wasn't amusing, it made me quite sad, actually, but uh, to see the uh, who was funding the opposition uh, to the uh, adult use uh, uh, propositions in a number of states was the prison lobby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I felt that if I was on the other side of a debate from the U.S. prison lobby, I felt that my moral compass was uh, pointing pretty much in the right direction. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, jumping back a little bit to what we were talking about before, as far as... Um, you know, uh, companies not learning that they can't be all things to all people. Um, Richard, what what area do you think are, is a little still undercapitalized at this stage of the market's growth? That's a that's a good question. I mean, what I can tell you is uh, what we're what we're seeing now. Um, so the the cannabis issuers on the uh, Canadian Securities Exchange, uh, even with the constraints, have raised. Um, uh, 1.25 billion Canadian uh, in the first six months of this year. Um, so there's a, still a significant interest uh, from various investors, Canadian, U.S., and uh, overseas, uh, in the uh, in the segment. Um, the companies that are attracting the capital again tend to be the U.S. MSOs. Um, the price tag on that capital has tended to go up. Uh, it's more likely to be a convertible offering with a a uh, coupon uh, at this point, um, although we're starting to see some straight equity deals again uh, as uh, valuations have improved uh, uh, since the pandemic began. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it's abundantly clear that there are still opportunities, uh, again, for the solid operators who understand the consumer packaged goods market. Um, there are lots more states to come on board. Um, you know, things are looking very promising in uh, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Um, I even hear folks in Texas uh, uh, talking about the likelihood of medical uh, programs being approved in Texas with the uh, Florida model uh, in mm -hmm. place, which uh, would give entrepreneurs substantial room to run. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the, uh, uh, the short answer there is there is a lot of investment opportunity left uh, without leaving uh, North America, uh, and in particular in the United States. I, I'm very excited to see uh, how the industry is going to develop uh, over the next uh, three to five years. John, what's your, uh, what's your take on that? So, uh, Any areas things. that you think are undercapitalized? So, so one I think that, that we're watching quite closely, and I think is just fascinating because it speaks to this idea that we're really still at the tip of this iceberg. Um, to me is the consumer product side of, of this ecosystem. So flour by and large now nationally, at least in the US accounts for a little over 50% of the product being sold. 
down from over 90% when these states first started legalizing and everybody was smoking before you, you had a viable edibles and topicals and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, vapes uh, uh, in, the, in the space. But even as you look at these new product categories, the edibles, the topicals, the, the vapes, um, in many respects, these are all, you know, relatively rudimentary forms of these, of these products. And I mean that in, in, from two angles. On the edible side in particular, um, you know, the, the product formulations have come a long way, but we think there's still tremendous room for innovation left in both what types of, of products are being infused with cannabis, um, uh, as well as how they're being formulated. Um, but also second, just in the kind of product branding. You know, for, for most consumers who are transitioning from an unregulated market to a legal one, most of them generally didn't know what they were consuming. Most of them were consuming flour um, and they were happy to get whatever they, they could get. So there was a really unsophisticated um, kind of orientation to, to the spectrum of, of uh, cannabis and cannabinoids, the variants in, in, in experiences that you could have with different cannabis products or um, the types of amplified experiences that you could have when you combine cannabis with other bot botanicals to, to enhance certain aspects of the experience. Um, and we're seeing companies starting to experiment with that. Uh, I, I look at a company like 1906 in, in Colorado that have just come out with a new line of what they call drops, which are um, cannabis-based pills, cannabis-based um, pills that they've um, selected. They've traveled the world finding uh, natural botanicals that enhance the types of effects that you, you experience um, with the cannabinoids that are in these pills. And this product was four years in the making. They had to work with uh, lab scientists out of 3M to, to figure out a new way to constituent, uh, 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 to constitute these products to deliver a hyper consistent experience. Uh, but they've really kind of broken new ground. And um, why use that as, as an example? Even as we're building this product, um, industry stakeholders were telling them cannabis consumers don't consume cannabis in pill form. There's no segment for this. This is a one, maybe 2% part of the market. Yet when they launched this product, even though they had a very successful line of chocolate edibles up until that point, um, they did what they thought was going to be a year's worth of sales in a little less than three months. Um, huge demand. Uh, consumers really appreciated kind of that these were products that did what they said in the jar uh, uh, on the label and did it in a really elegant way. And it just goes to show that, you know, accepting consumers at face value in terms of them saying what they want, they don't know what they want because they haven't seen yet what the possibilities are. And so for the innovators, for, for the risk takers who are going to be defining the next chapter of uh, the cannabis product ecosystem, we think there's still huge room for innovation um, to, to, to not just innovate with the types of genetics and, and experiences that, that can be produced with cannabis, but in the types of products that can, can, can be created by constituting and mixing cannabis with other types of botanicals. And then third, in branding it in a way that is resonant to the experiences consumers are looking for and that, that tell stories that reflect who your target consumers are. Um, across that line, across the product ecosystem, we think there's huge opportunity um, that's still untapped and we're excited to see what the next few years will bring. Right. Well, we, you and I have talked about this at length about the, um, just that with the onset of this COVID-19, if that's one of the reasons why people have been shying away from flour and taking on edibles and with the respiratory issues that come along with, um, you know, coronavirus, there's just so many different factors that you're not sure if it's just trending this way, but it seems like, I think a lot of consumers like the convenience that these new options that they're getting allow. Um, yeah, that's certainly been the case in uh, Canada where the, uh, uh, you know, our few uh, retail outlets have been simply unable to keep um, uh, topicals and uh, edibles in stock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are almost out of time, so I'm going to leave it here. But I want to thank you guys both so much for joining us today. And thank you to the listeners for joining us at Canna Week. Please be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast. And you can find these new stories and more on our New Frontier Data's Cannabis Insights Daily. Check out our, um, you can check out our website and subscribe on our website, newfrontierdata.com. I'm your host, Heather Wicklin, and we will see you next time.